that's them. That's the way that they communicate. That's how they get across their ideas. When you're conversing with a deaf person, if you make some noises, completely fine. I'm talking about professional working interpreters. When you are standing up in a room full of people, nobody wants to hear you step up and like whisper, put your hands together when you're making signs. It's very distracting. Okay? So when you're interpreting into ASL, it should be the signs channel only. So if you hear yourself making noises, coughing, whatever, you're not channeling the interpretation appropriately. Is that clear? Okay. Most of the time when you're going from ASL into spoken English, the camera is not on you, the camera is on the deaf person. So it really doesn't matter if you're kind of signing a few things in your lap or moving your hands when you're voicing into spoken English because nobody can see you doing it anyways. So we wouldn't know if it was being channeled inappropriately. But if you happen to be standing up or sitting somewhere where the audience can see you and your hands are moving and you're, and then we went to the zoo, I think, and you're moving, then it's not channeled appropriately. It should be just spoken English and that's all you should hear and or see. Questions or comments? No? All right. Within the channeled appropriately, there's expressive modalities. We have image, sound, and texture. Spoken languages, we know, use sound. Written languages, written and signed, use images, so they're visual images. And we do use textile, textile, tactile in deaf blind interpreting. Okay? That was part of Cerny's article. So the second C is is the interpretation clearly articulated? If we're going from spoken English into ASL or conceptually accurate signed English, either way, your target is signed. So it needs to be formally produced signs, no no here on your cheek. That's for conversational signing. It always has to be no. That's the formal. Remember the five parameters of a sign? I'm sorry. It has to be a no. 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 K-N-O-W. What are the five parameters of a sign? Location. Location. Movement. Movement. Handshape. Palm orientation. Handshape. Handshape. And placement. Okay. So this is a placement. Did we say placement? Location. Location. Sorry. Location placement. Um, Location, movement, palm orientation, handshape, and, and non-manual. Um, so this is location. This is the inappropriate location. So every time you sign no like this, it's wrong. Now, we do it in casual conversation all the time, right? And we see deaf people do it all the time. That's how we learn how to do it. But it's not the appropriate way for that sign to be produced. So when you're looking at your own work, you are looking for full, formal, appropriate sign production. Clear facial expressions. What type of facial expressions are we looking for? Eyebrows up and down. Non-manuals, eyebrows up, eyebrows down, if it's a question, yes, no, WH. Right. Facial expressions are part of the grammar. They need to be produced accurately. So you're looking at your work for that. Head nods, body shifts, okay? It has to be crisp and clear. No longer for you is it about communication. It's about interpreting, and it's about interpreting clearly. Am I freaking you out? A little bit? A little bit. None of you have real major issues with production, so I'm not worried about it. If you're going from ASL into spoken English, your volume has to be loud enough for people to hear you. Usually as interpreters, when we're voicing, what we call voicing, we're sitting in the front and the audience is behind us. So we have to project louder, otherwise you would hear it like this and you might not hear what I'm saying because it's not loud enough for the people back there. So you need to make sure that you're projecting loud enough. Is your pitch right? Pronunciation and articulation, it must be clear, must be clear, okay? Occasionally, 
occasionally when we're talking really fast, we slur our words together. They don't come out as crisp as we would like. We have to think about that and be cognizant of the fact that people are relying on us to get this message. It must be as clear as possible. Okay? So when you're analyzing your own work, if you're going into sign or you're going into spoken English, one of the things that you're going to analyze and look for and comment on is the clarity. All right. The next one is, is it comfortably paced? Target language to the source language, the pace of your production of interpreting is going to base, be based mostly on your fluency with the language. Okay. When you come up here or you've been practicing interpreting today, how many of you are a little choppy? So you start to sign something and then you have to stop and think about it or you're searching for a sign. You have an incomplete sentence, and then it comes on to you what you need, and then you put it out there. And so there's this. Uh, 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 uh. So imagine yourself being a deaf consumer who is trying to watch this and figure out what you're saying. Okay. The process of interpreting. We'll talk about it more in consecutive if you haven't had it yet. The process of interpreting is basically a three-step process. We comprehend the message first, we reformulate it into the target message, target language, and then the expression or the output. What happens when you're rushed, you're worried you're going to forget something, is we put the second and the third step together. So you're actually developing the sentence that you're going to use while you're already signing. And that's what makes it choppy. What we need to do is listen, get an entire concept, reformulate it in our head. We haven't picked up our hands yet. We're not signing yet. What is the ASL sentence that I'm going to use to convey this message? I got it. I'm going to use a rhetorical. Here we go. Now I just put it out and it comes out nice and smooth because I have it solidified already cognitively. Does that make sense? How many of you rush through it and you <laughs> you pick up your hands right away and you start one or two signs and then you go, oh, no, now I forgot the sign that I want to use next and then there's a stutter or a stop, okay? It's really difficult for our consumers to extrapolate meaning when it's all choppy like that. And we're making them work more. We're the interpreters. Instead of, here's the message, I put it out, it's all choppy, you figure it out. No, oh, we're supposed to figure it out and then put it out nice and smooth. Okay. So when you're analyzing your own work, you're looking for that. Is there a nice flow? Does it all kind of flow together? When you're working in consecutive, same thing. You still have to have a nice flow. You get the whole message, and then when you start, here's that concept. Was it nice and smooth, and did it look good? Does that make sense? Any questions about that? No? Okay. Oh, I don't know what C we're on. Four, five, something. Four. Complete. Grammatically complete is what we're talking about. Does your interpretation comply with the grammar and structure of the target language? If it doesn't, it's usually because you have the other languages structure intruding upon your output. So we call them intrusion. Your goal is ASL. You pick up your hands. It comes out in a very English order. We call that English intrusion. Okay, so you're not letting go of the English and looking for the ASL structure. So your target language, y'all are laughing like, yep, yeah, that's me. That's my problem. The target language output is sometimes ASL, and then it's an English sentence, then an ASL sentence. Stick with one, pick one, know one, make sure every sentence is signed grammatically correct in that target language. Make sense? Yep. Within this category, also, you're looking at formal versus casual. Really? As working professional interpreters, unless you're doing VRS, or sometimes maybe in a doctor's office, you can get into a sort of casual, intimate type of register. 
overall, the majority of the work that we do, we're professional. So err on the side of caution and always go for a bit formal, formal um, register and formal interpretation as opposed to a casual one. Okay. Again, when you're working. When you're conversing with deaf people, casual, intimate, you can have a sloppy no, K-N-O-W, sign with one hand instead of two, that's fine. But not as a working interpreter. As a working interpreter, it has to be crisp, clear, and mostly formally produced. Complete grammatically. Some of our deaf consumers are bilingual, very, very well educated in English, competent in English as well as ASL. Depending on a given situation, they might want to see the English that the people are using, so they want you to sign in an English order. They want you to copy, basically, the English that you hear. We call that CASE, C-A-S-E, Conceptually Accurate Signed English. Okay? So, if that's the case, then your target is going to be signing in English order. And you're looking for full, complete English sentences on your hand and or manually. Jen? Is case the same as PSC? Yes. Yeah. PSC is, is the old term that we used to use, oh. pigeon signed English. Um, and some people still use it. You'll hear it out there. Uh, but most people will call it case now, or they'll just call it transliteration. And it's conceptually accurate signing. You will learn how to produce that when you hit transliteration class uh -huh. with me your junior year. I yeah, I know. Most of us are like, woohoo, I got the <laughs> transliteration down. <laughs> now, if you could teach me ASL, I'd be good. Right? Yeah. Um, all right, so within here again, you need to have conceptual sign choices. So it has to be the right sign to convey the right meaning, and that would make it grammatically correct. The fifth C, or the sixth C, is conceptual accuracy. So within the grammatically correct sentence structure, you also have to have the right sign choices. Um, let me give you a couple of examples. We all know the run, R-U-N. Is it a run in your pantyhose? Is it the car running? Are you running? Is your nose running? You have to pick the right conceptual sign to convey the meaning. Um, there's another one that we get stuck on quite often. Won't and um, I just had it. Work. Oh, that really works. And people do. That really works. But it means it really works. It's successful. So not going literal, but making sure that the sign that we choose actually conveys the meaning. That's what you're looking for. You're analyzing your work, looking for meaning-based sign choices, not superficial, surface, or literal. Any questions about that? Um, and I can take this PowerPoint for it. I some of you taking notes. Great. I love it. Um, I'll put it up on Oasis in the Bridge class so that you can print it or um, get it. Okay, the next C is cohesive organization. This is one of the most challenging aspects for any new interpreter. As most of you know, your senior year practicum one, you will take the EIPA test. There's four sections that they will assess you on. Your sign to voice, your voice to sign, your amount of vocabulary, and this fourth section is your interpreting, cohesive, discourse, mapping section. Most of our students, brand new interpreting students, really do poorly here. It's one of those massively advanced level skills that really only comes with a lot of interpreting practice. Okay? Some of you in the feedback that I've given you already, you might have seen, you need more links, you need more transitions. In order to break it down and make it kind of simple for you to understand, 
you as the interpreter become the storyteller. It has to look like you are telling a story. When we tell a story, we use transitional phrases. Then we, next, after that, I went. In our interpreting, what happens is we hear a concept, we put it out. We hear another concept, we put it out. Here's another one, here's a sentence. How all these concepts link together is what's missing. Sometimes it won't be in the source. You won't hear it in the English. Then we, but it's implied. You know it as a hearing person listening to the story. We need to take that implicit and we need to make it explicit and we need to add that to our interpretation. Does that make sense? And that builds the whole story so it's easier for our consumers to follow and how things link together. Any questions about that? I, I, when you take my classes, I will be hounding this point home over and over and over again. You'll be working on it for the next two years. Tony? So when you are using like the transitions for like that and that's, would it be appropriate at sometimes to use like listing for that? Absolutely. Oh. Listing is a transition too. Referencing, referring back. Remember, I just talked about that man. It might not have been something that the speaker said, but implicitly they're referring back to that person. Or how many of you have ended a sentence with a prepositional phrase, that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Makes me crazy. What is that? Reiterate the noun. Just tell me again what it is. That could be anything in this universe. I will chop your hands off. <laughs> know that at the end of a sentence. It doesn't work. Okay? Instead of saying that, reiterate it. That man with the black shirt. Instead of saying that or him. Reiterate it. Make it crystal clear. I have a question. If you have established something someplace, if you're a school someplace, can you carry it in that because it's Absolutely. Yeah, that's not what I mean. I mean, most of the time where you just, you know, blah, 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 that. Okay. Yeah, that. Because it's because you're a little lazy. You're taking the shortcut. You don't want to make it fully clear. You're afraid you're going to miss the next piece of information, so you don't want to add that in. What that? That what? Okay, so that is what I'm talking about. Not that. If you set something up and say, that's cool. Yeah, okay. that. You set it up, you can refer to it as that. Good? Again, our job is to interpret. It's to transfer the meaning from one language into another. We don't want to make our consumers have to work harder. That's what we're getting paid for. It has to be crystal clear. The next C, confident presentation. Fake it until you make it. I don't care if you are so nervous, if you have giant sweat stains under your arm, if you ran to the bathroom and puked before the interpreting job. I have nervous pee. I went to the bathroom five, six times before I do a big job. Whatever you need to do, whatever you're feeling inside, I don't want to see it. Nobody wants to see it. If you look like you are unsure of yourself, you're going to lose your audience trust. They're going to, oh, that's a new interpreter. Oh. Can I get that whole message? Was that right? Should I ask for clarification? Because I'm not sure. They don't look like they really know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So regardless of what you feel inside, regardless of having to use circumlocution because you can't remember the signs that you want, just always look confident about what you're doing. Okay? That will build the audience trust. Part of confident presentation is also your ability to self-analyze or self-monitor during the process and then self-correct. Now, a lot of times too, I will hear students say, well, I knew I did that wrong in the moment. <laughs> I think Becky, we talked about this earlier. She signed ticket instead of article, and she's like, I know, I can't figure out what to sign for article is, so I'm just going to keep going with it. So you're aware of it. You're able to self-monitor. That's great, but don't stop there. Now you have to correct yourself. And it's okay. You're going to miss things. You're going to make mistakes. 
Be confident about them. Every interpreter does. Doesn't mean that you're a bad interpreter. Just make that correction. Make sure the information is conveyed accurately and move on. Okay. Some of that really involves you analyzing yourself. As teachers or interpreter educators, I can't see what's going on in the black box of your brain. So I may look and say, that was the wrong sign. You have to tell me what was happening in that moment. Oh, I couldn't think of the sign. I gave up. I took the shortcut. I moved on. You have to analyze yourself and what you were thinking and why you didn't make the correction. Because if you make a correction, the interpretation was not wrong. There is no error. It wipes out the error. Does that make sense? So big deal, you made an error, you used the wrong sign choice. If the next minute you clear it up, there was never an error. It never existed because we got the accurate information. Okay. So that's what you're looking at for yourself. You want to identify the errors that you make, but you also want to look and see, am I correcting them? Was I aware in the moment that I made an error? Okay. That's part of being a responsible interpreter. Good? All right, we're almost done. The next C is cultural um, adjustment. If you all have not switched back there yet, you want to switch because I'm almost done. Okay? Um, cultural adjustments. Good, good interpreters will always think about their consumer. These individuals in front of me are deaf. Or these individuals who I'm going from ASL into English are hearing. What's their culture? What do they know about deafness? What don't they know? Here's the deaf consumer. What do they know about call waiting or some musical genre or something that isn't necessarily a part of their lives? And you will add in that cultural mediation. We call it expansion. Here's the message, but we have to expand on it a little bit to ensure complete understanding across cultures, right? Some of the easiest things, name signs, residential schools, okay, those are easy, those are things you learn right away. If someone says this, you know you auto signs this, you know you automatically don't say institute because that has a negative connotation in the deaf community. You learn to say residential programs, residential schools for the deaf, that's the cultural mediation. But it's not just the simple things. You have to think about the lived, culturally rich lives of deaf people and the hearing people that they're coming in contact with and make sure that you're bridging those cultural differences. In class here, many of the DVDs that you'll interpret won't have a lot of cultural adjustments that you'll have to make. It's when you start doing the live in class, interpreting in dialogues or genres class, or when you actually start your practicum and you get out there and you have real life people, um, that's when you actually start adding more cultural modifications to your interpreting. Any questions about that? No? Okay, composed affect. Oh, I have two more and then class is over. You become the speaker when you are interpreting. You are them. You are interpreting in first person if they're using inflection, emphasis, intonation, if they're about ready to cry. All of that affective development must be transferred into your interpretation. Okay? You have to match them. If you don't match them, your deaf consumers don't walk away with the same impact as the hearing consumers, then you have done something wrong. Then the interpretation is not successful. Good? Do we? Can I go back? Yep. Okay, we're good. Okay. And the last one, and the most important of all, is, is the information correct? Okay. Have you transferred the accurate meaning without omissions, with no addition of information to the message, with no crazy sign salad anomalies that we have no idea what you're saying, with no 
other language intrusions, okay, and with all of the details and the intent from the original source language speaker. It has to be accurate. That's where you have to sometimes develop the guts to stop someone and ask them, could you please repeat that? Because you missed it. You know you missed it. You have to have the confidence to stop them. Because your responsibility is to get that message across accurately. You can't take a shortcut. You can't leave things out. Good? All right. So that's Cerny's 10 C's. That's how we start teaching you how to analyze your own work. The rubric that I've developed, that I have, in consecutive and for the rest of the remainder of this summer course, I will be using that, 10 C's. So from now on, any video that you turn into me for feedback must be accompanied with your own reflection based on the 10 C's. If I don't read your reflection first, I won't give you feedback on the video. Okay? The main purpose behind that is so that I know we're on the same page. You see in your work what I see in your work, and you're learning how to analyze it and identify your own strengths and weaknesses. Okay? Doesn't have to be on this form. You can type it on an email just, was it channeled appropriately? Yes. Or I made a couple of loud slappy noises. But as long as it hits those 10 things and you comment on those 10 things. Good? Questions, comments, concerns, class is over. You can stop recording. The last slide. The last